lot of the um, abductees, including the people that, have, that, that uh, all the people came before you in their books, have, uh, you know, Whitney Streamer, um, when it comes to mind, have these portents of doom and the world ending and all this going on in uh, their, their uh, whatever, in their experiences. And I was wondering how you dealt with that and how much, how much stake you place in it. Well, first off, I never had anything consciously told to me or shown to me, as other people in my family have, and other groups of uh, people have been shown the destruction of this and that. I haven't had that that I'm consciously aware of. But what happened was I woke up on August 4th, 1989, with no memory of any event happening, but programmed to get the hell out of Dodge City as soon as possible. We were living in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The compulsion was very specific, extremely urgent, uh, overwhelming. I had to make, I made plans with my son, who was a graduate student in physics at the time. I made plans with him, the family, every my husband worked in one place, I was in another teaching, where we could meet within 15 minutes at a certain point to get out. I loaded the car with every single item I could think of for starting over. We had this plan, and that's the only way I could even go to sleep at night was knowing we've got a plan, we can get out of here, we got the potential. And this pushed me so hard for two years, Greg, until I thought I was going to about lose it. We had to get out of the area, and it took two years to get the money and the ability to fulfill the rest of the picky requirements. It had to be at least 20 acres, I had to have my own water supply, I had to have my own fuel supply, I had to be in a very sparsely populated area. Do it. Once and we had no is this clue. what the, uh, the moving to rural area thing is and all those exactly. other women is just about exactly. the same kind of thing? When I got there, of course, I ran into probably 30 different abductees all around the country who were programmed and compelled to get out of New York, Oregon, Arizona, Iowa, Iowa to Arkansas. I haven't a clue why. I know it was not my own general inclination to do this. I never wanted to live in the woods. I'm a, I'm a girl. I don't like the bugs, I don't like the crap. This was not something I just suddenly woke up and said, oh, I need to do this. It was, you need to do this now. And until I moved into the house we built on the 23 acres, this did not go away. The minute we, I didn't even take my truck until we moved in. It's gone. Now that's how I personally was treated by this phenomenon. I have not a clue that had to do with construction. I don't buy for a minute. And if you read and uh, taken the chapter about when I was told about the Jacob and Esau scenario. You know, I'm a high skeptic anyway, and then I'm told this is a manipulation, and I don't know who it was telling me that they did not act like the aliens acted. The scenario did not feel like an alien scenario. I was given a very different treatment than I've ever been given at the end of aliens. I don't know who it was. But it was, uh, it made me very suspicious of, I may confirm more a sense I've had ever since I heard the term New Age is that there are people being taken for such a ride, being put on this spiritual sled to their own, I don't want to say destruction, but to their own delusion. So maybe it was a self-generated event, although when I was able to get up right in the middle of it and check my environment, get up to the bathroom, look around, when I admitted I laid back down, I mean, I hadn't even closed my eyes to it. All right, I'm back in the chair, let's resume. You know what's funny is something that Richard told me along, I don't know, about four or five, six months ago, he, he said that uh, there was some, the people, you know he knows, supposedly knows some people, some, some legal sources right. in the government. Is that one of the reasons why you talk to him a lot? Do you get any contact? No, I knew him before that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He, we met because he was assigned to review my first book. And oh, okay. Well, the thing I was going to mention about him saying was about four, four, five or six months ago was that uh, he said, I don't know if he was trying to scare me or what. He's oh. usually very straight with me. In fact, I think he is always straight with me. But he said um, somebody, could, somebody, the, the technology is available for somebody to park a truck out on the street and let you see whatever, let them see, let you see whatever they want you to see without coming into your house. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, for some reason, every time you come up with one of these virtual reality scenarios or anything like that, that's the first thing I think of. It's bad that I have to, I, I think I it's channeled that I way know. right now. It will probably change in another few months or years. Well, if I... And you do that helicopter yeah. thing, I, I, right. I, you heard a helicopter and I said, well, why isn't it that somebody is hovering over the house and doing this? And 
no way a very human agency. Yeah. Well, it was very human. I mean, this is obviously virtual reality targeting. Uh -huh. It's not a real helicopter. Ted and, and Marie would have heard it. Uh -huh. okay. But the deposit, which a lot of people have tried to push me and others toward, that this is totally a human mind control and a nefarious scenario, cannot be supported by the evidence I personally see. It, I think there is so much in, the, in their hands of playing catch up with the alien technology and ability and a way to get a handle on what we're having done to us is to imitate, to learn from, you know, their technology. But we, I'm concerned, I mean, I'm confident of case reports back in 1905. We didn't have this technology then, I'm sorry. Right. My husband's first abduction in 1947, Labor Day of 47, I'm truly doubtful we had the capability. The one when he was playing with his friends or something? No, no, that was when he was 12 years old. In 1947, okay. he was 11 months old. He and his father oh. had an abduction in the Sierra Foothills. My dad was frozen at the wheel and he was taken. Oh, that's right, that's right. I yeah. remember reading that one. I really don't think we had the sophisticated technology. Today, God knows what they're doing, but I know the history of this scenario is longer than our history of this technology. So, I'm not convinced. Okay. Do you think it goes back uh, further through history? Do you like uh, uh, Blaze ideas that, you know, it's similar to the fairy lore? Well, we're talking really hypothetically now. I mean, I, as long as you realize I'm just playing with ideas and then not going on the evidence, because these things lie. That's something I'm really sure of is they lie like dogs. And they, they say they own us, you know. Um, have you ever read The Way of the Shaman? Do you remember early on the man talking about when he went down to South America to study with one of the best of the shaman teachers and he had taken the really dangerous psychedelic that you could die or whatever and he sees these great reptoid things coming in from space and they claim this is theirs and they own it and you know, we're there. And he goes back to the shaman and tells them what they said and the shaman left and oh yeah, they lie like dogs. It's not that you know? it, Actually, it's funny that you uh, mentioned that. My, I'm working on the new issue of my magazine that I do, and a friend of mine did an article using that exact sequence there and comparing it to the, uh, the reptoids that are right. experiencing right. the other right. I, I think they, they may well have been messing with us for a long time, but I, and I'll tell you just very simply, and it may save you a lot of other questions, Greg, people say, what's your general take on what's going on? And it's personal, it is based on evidence, but it's not enough evidence for me to make a solid case in any one particular area. So what makes the most sense to me, given what I know and what I've been through and what I've seen other people do, is the scenario in general that we are, and again, maybe it's more keelish than valet-ish, we are a highly valued resource that is husbanded at the farmer, husband, the dairy cow. And, they, and it would explain so much about why it's transgenerational and the effects, why the genetic work is done. Our farmers will upgrade the stock to make the perfect breed of cattle as long as they can. When they get to give, a, give a farmer a choice between taking a sick kid to the doctor and a sick cow to the vet, that cow gets to the vet, you know? And, and those cows may well, if they were thinking, say, God, that farmer's so wonderful to us. He takes such good care of us, and I've had his miraculous healing, and I'm so protected, and he loves me so much. <laughs> And you don't kill, you don't invade cows. You know, they say, well, they haven't invaded, they must be benevolent. You don't invade cows, you use them. That's right. a different thing. Yeah. And, and you also, part of what they may have done to us in the past, assuming this hypothesis that they've been messing with the breed for a long time is... If you read uh, Sitchin or... Yeah, but Sitchin's Sitchin Sitchin a whole other thing, man. The guy has so, according to anybody in his field in, our, in, in academia, the really? guy makes up his interpretations yeah. of that stuff. Uh -huh. But they're not well, there's another one that's much closer to what you're saying. God's 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 right. Yeah. And the only problem I had with, with his book was that he needed a real good editor. His logic leaps were, were he could fall in and break a leg. But, you know, other than that. Get back up. Yeah. But, uh... If they have been genetically working with us for a long time, it, if I were them, now this is, you know, it's a centric, so surely they're, you know, yeah. they, I would have genetically brought the stock, the cows, up to a point of intelligence where they could pretty much run the farm for themselves, so all I had to come in and do was periodic harvesting. Mm -hmm. And the theory that I'm hoping we get evidence to help support is that they did this upgraded the intelligence level of the 
occurred to be self-maintaining and that it's proving to be a, two, a double-edged sword right. because once you kick it into gear, the old butterfly effect, it keeps going mm -hmm. and we're developing still more perceptive abilities and, and intelligence to the point where we're beginning to see what they're doing to us, how they're doing it, and through their allusions to where the cows are going to get so uppity, they ain't going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they started something that they thought was for their benefit that may turn around to be what ultimately we use but to really in, in, in learning this stuff and discussing it like you do and putting our books on it, people are, some people are learning to think in a different way. See, when I come and talk to you, I don't know, maybe if I was somebody else, I would try and get some kind of concrete opinion out of you or a position or... But I don't have one. Yeah, and you don't have <laughs> one. And, and, yeah, exactly. Because my wife is like, you, you never tell me that you have an opinion on it. Why don't you have an opinion? like, yes, I don't. If I have an opinion, I'm going to, I'm going to, I won't listen anymore. Well, you can change your opinion. The, I don't know very many people like that at all. Well, I'm so afraid of being taken. this is taken causing people to think like that. Lot of I'm so afraid of everything in that. I'm not afraid. I don't want anything to do. But I'm so reluctant to be taken in by a false thing mm -hmm. that I will reject what may well be the truth as long as possible until the truth is irrevocable. I don't want to. I mean, even when I pray, I don't say, God, help me. I say, if there's a God of truth and love, that's the one I'm talking to. I don't want the rest of you guys. And I'm saying if. So you're talking to probably the most skeptical person who's been through this stuff. And I'd give anything if I had something concrete I could stand on and hold on to. I really would. But it's got to be right or I don't want it. I think we're not going to have anything concrete. Well, they design it where we have so little. And, and the, the rules always change. You get a handle on this, and immediately yeah. they change where the handle is. Mm -hmm. you know? It's quite amazing. Yeah. And they're certainly not studying us to learn about the race. They know us better than we know ourselves. Mm -hmm. They can manipulate us far better than we can each other. Just as scary. And I, <laughs> I think crossbreeding is one of the big illusion scams they're pulling on us. I really do. Something to, to, to uh, like you said, it, something true is here, something true is here. To think you have a handle, and in between you have this hammock of junk that's right. going to evaporate. What a wonderful propaganda tool to make us think we share offspring. And they're doing it to save us on top of that. Of course, they tell other people they're doing it to save them, you know, but... So they truly are space brothers. <laughs> yeah, right. We must have some commonality. We can breathe. Yeah, right. You know, I, I, yet, when I see the hybrid nursery down here, and not the illusion possibility that we get over and over, I think they run some movies, They're, they've got some favorite movies, they run for almost everybody on the virtual reality scale. Uh -huh. And uh, that puts out a consistent, you know, Hopkins is one of the worst, as much as I admire, and I do admire him. He's one of the worst to say, I throw out the anomalous details, so I've got 20, 30, 200 cases of it, I'm not going to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Well, sure, they're running the same damn movie over and over. You get these, and then you know, what's it? Well, we know what it is. We've had it 200 times. Mm -hmm. The truth, to me, more likely is going to lie in the anomalous detail. Right. So we, we come at this from a whole different approach, and he's been very, very reluctant to pay much attention to anything I've had to say. And I have paid a lot of attention to what he said. But I wish it could be well, reciprocal. Well, stepping stone. Yeah, and it's, it's very well you and people you know, maybe. Well, maybe, but I know that he has, has done enormous work, and we couldn't be doing a lot of what any of us could do if it wasn't for that. Exactly. I just wish you could see the logic I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe I get through one of these You know days. why? Because it's a logic of illogic, almost. But it's a logic of leaving logic behind to uh, more, you know, it's kind of a holistic, yeah, non very non-linear way of thinking about it. Well, and even though he's an artist, which I find it hard that yes, he thinks in the way he does, yes. but he's a non-representational well, artist. This is what blows my mind, too. You know, <laughs> this would have jumped out at the guy right off. Mm -hmm. Hey, they're all telling the same story because they all went to see the same movie. Right, they just not take anything about who made the movie. Right. right. Directed it. And we know movies, you guys come from an area where movies ain't reality, right? Okay. Okay, um, has anybody criticized you for, for telling, because I know about your experiences and bringing in things that they don't think are relevant? I mean, this is a rhetorical question, but it's something I want to hear your opinion on. No, Like what Hopkins would say, these things happen, but we don't want to tell you about it because we don't want to contaminate the, uh, the data. Yeah, Bud has said that about his own stuff, but he's never said to me, don't tell people this stuff. He chooses to be paternalistic and protective. 
towards the deputies and towards the audience, and he has explained, I think, in public that he's trying to reach a mainstream group, and you don't give them everything at once because they'd run off and wouldn't listen, so you feed them a little at time. Well, that's just not my approach. I think people are adults and have a right to the back. So, you know, we just come at a different philosophical take on it. But nobody has told me not to. Richard Boylan has said, and well, in Lincoln I was told, so please don't, you know, put this in, like, black and white necessarily in the paper, but... I was giving a presentation in Boylan was there selling books and wasn't in the room. And something I said apparently triggered a memory in a woman in the audience and suddenly she sort of moaned, screamed, got up and ran out of the room. Have I've seen that in the Bud Hawkins? Yeah, of course. And when it happens when people's memories suddenly flash, you're going to get a response. And she was embarrassed, so she didn't come back in. I went and talked to her later. It was nothing I had done or said. It was the triggering of a memory that she'd already had. Well, Boylan heard about this. He wasn't in the room. But he heard about this, and apparently I was told that he said I was a dangerous person who should not be allowed to speak in public, and that I had been and that I had been apparent that I had been describing mutilations, and that's what had terrified the woman made her scream. Well, that's nothing even close to the truth, and that's the only person who I've heard specifically target me for any criticism. I'm sure there's been tons of it. I just haven't heard it. So no. You explained this in the, in the lecture, but I just wanted to encapsulate it for when I uh, trans, transcribe this. And you kind of answered in the book, too. Why do you use the term ETs and aliens when you say you can't take any experiences at face value? And my guess is it's just going to be... It's a shorthand. It's a shorthand term. Yeah. I could call them, you know, something else. But alien, see, I'm an English teacher, and we get real stupidly picky on things like definitions. Mm -hmm. And alien means other. I don't okay. have a better term than that. I could call them the others. But, yeah, the uh, other the, the other uh, term that people are playing with now is between abductee and experiencer. An experiencer to me just sounds so politically correct. I just I don't want to I don't well, want to use it. For that. No, I, I use the term abductee because I'm an English teacher who understands the definition of words. Mm -hmm. We are abducted. Yeah. Sorry, Thanks. Hendrix. We were experienced with Jimi Hendrix. Everything we were is an experience with the aliens. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I'm an experiencer when I'm, when I'm breathing. Of course, that's the point. And, uh, you know, I, I really think words are important. And he's wanting them to be important because he's scared shit with them to eat. He doesn't want to piss them off. I think that's really the thing with, with people who have to find themselves taking that kind of stand is they're afraid. I'm just not afraid anymore. I mean, I, I have told them a long time ago, don't bother threatening me. Don't bother threatening my child or my husband. I know we're all going to die. Hey, that's no threat. You know? I'm not afraid. I, if I could get my hands on them, I would do some things myself, but I'm not afraid. You know? If I could, but see, you never get that chance. The minute they're there, you're under control, and you think you feel the way they want you to. Oh, thank you. There you go. Thanks. Right. Isn't it? Okay, sir. Tabasco or salsa or something? Tabasco? That would be fine. Sir. Did you want to eat and not talk? Yeah, I can do either one. Please suit yourself. Oh, okay. They want to hear us chewing with us. We're sitting here, and we're at the UFO convention, MUFON, which is an American organization. There are foreign organizations that do the same thing. But I don't hear of any abduction accounts, probably because... You know, when the United States travels to other countries. Oh, lots of people do. You're just not talking to them. Yeah. Uh, do you know... Um, Are they similar or... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get some physical differences and then you get some real identical things. And you get people like Michael Hesseman who have the... to say only Americans have bad abductions by grades or red toys. It's not true. It's our culture. No, it's, it's Michael Hesseman's little... Yeah, right. <laughs> We're all paranoid. You know, it's like the guy who explained that Americans have guilt over what they did to the Native Americans. You know, you can, you can play with all this if you want to, but if you start looking at what really comes in firsthand, yes, it's going on in South Africa, it's going on in Russia, it's going on in France. Sure, South America, I mean, everywhere's got it. Um, almost the same here, scenario? Or in variation. many cases, almost the same, if not the same, in some areas a whole lot worse. I mean, there's some stuff going on in South America that I just think, please don't let that happen up here. You know, I mean, really. You know, it's and funny, a lot of stuff's going on in South America that's always been a little bit more intense. Even mm -hmm. from the 50s, it's been a little mm -hmm. more intense, if you want to call it that, right. than it's right. here. But, um, Do you think that's a culturally specific thing, or 
a, an error, I mean, a, a, a result of perception or? It may possibly be cultural bias. It may be um, communication. It may be that the people involved in ufology um, do their own kind of censoring, consciously or unconsciously, of what's passed around. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not on the inside, Greg, of any of ufology. I'm a member of nothing. I have no backers or endorsers. Um, for the most part, the, the big names, the Fab Four and all the rest, pretty much you can try to ignore, avoid me or ignore it. So I'm not a person I can tell you what's going on around the world except through the people I have managed to have contact with who do know these people and tell me what's coming in. Do you think that helps you or hinders you? Or it's irrelevant to me. It's just a fact. I mean, if you're going to ask me global questions, I, I'm so limited in my ability yeah. to give you some hard yeah, answers. Yeah, that's why I asked. Yeah. Oh, there was, a, I was, I reread uh, Into the Fringe one more time before I came here, and I noticed there was that uh, incident with your therapist, Dr. Uh -huh. Riley, or whatever you called him in the book. The stupid therapist? Yeah, yeah. yeah. he said, call me the stupid therapist. When you said you called him back right before you did the book, and he said, well, I wouldn't have said that to you now, believe me. Did you ever find out why he said that? Because you leave it at that and go to the next no, chapter. No, I tried to get him to tell me why, actually. I said, why is that? What have you learned from sinning? He says, well, I was just so unprofessional. I was just so unprofessional. He would not go into that with me. And I even sent him not long after that, not because I endorsed it, because I don't know anything about it except what they put out on the surface. I sent in the um, announcement about treat. <laughs> you know, some of, you, some of your people ostensibly need to be paying some attention to this. They've got a whole thing that needs on it. Maybe you should educate yourself. But, oh, there may well be he's done it. He, he, what he indicated without saying was that he has learned at that point enough to know he shouldn't have dismissed it out of hand. Farther than that, the guy, he's an academic, he wouldn't go any further, he's a young one wanting to get a career going, you know, he's not going to say anything. So, no, he never said, oh, yeah, I've been abducted, or now I know it's true, he just said, no, I, I, I could have been angry that way. from that to just thinking he was rude. Mm -hmm. you know? The worst moment in my abductee life, however, was with that man when I called him back six months later. How are you? Okay. And asked if I could meet him for coffee over at the university. And said I wanted, and he said, yeah, and I said, I want to ask you why you were so certain six months ago when I taught you that there's no such thing as flying saucers or agreement. What do you know that makes you so certain? And we were having that conversation. But the worst moment I think I've ever felt was when I said, well, what do you, how, how are we supposed to, since you're not going to examine us psychologically, you say psychologically, but you won't touch us. What are we supposed to do about all these? And I showed him I had a couple of fresh puncture marks. What do we do about this? Because we're not imagining this stuff. And he reached out. And my hand was, I mean, I feared. He reached out. I wouldn't be telling people you have those marks. He said, they'll know you've been abusing yourself. Oh, yeah. I remember you mentioned that And I think that was the lowest point emotionally I have felt in all of this. That's interesting because I had another question about this, and I hope it doesn't offend you, but... No, it won't offend me. <laughs> Your dad, I mean, God, I can take anything, I guess. See, because I, I, after I read all these things, I, I can, both Wes and I, people we know do reading in other areas of anomalous experience, and one of them was that uh, when I heard about all the marks and things like that, you know about the... the uh, the phenomenon of stigmata where people with religious beliefs will take on the wounds of Christ. Have you ever dealt with that scenario in, in connection with marks on people's bodies like that? I have tried to consider that as an explanation. Um, the sheer weight of what I've been through case after case and the marks that I've examined, I don't, I can't, I mean, I was hoping that's what it was, say. Yeah. It's not. Uh, in my opinion, to my I mean, I can put that on my list of facts as far as I'm concerned. It's not stigmata. Uh, I have, when I moved to Arkansas, I decided I wasn't going to have a doctor I couldn't be honest with. I lucked into finding a doctor who just happened to have had a family relative, family member who had, had a UFO sighting. And the doctor knew the relative was telling the truth. So she was open to explain my situation. said, I want you to be able to document and examine in the future, anything other than the bruises and punctures, which all they can say is, yeah, you got a puncture, yeah, you got a bruise. They can't tell you anything more than that. 
always refer people to if they can reach her. Has done, yeah, people have thought they had a, they had a dream that might have been something, uh -huh. and they wanted to look, they knew a the situation, they knew anything there, yeah. I was turning it around because every time you look at we'd regress them and this came out, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, well, nothing. About nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but things have come out that were nothing. But other than my husband's initial memory of the 11 month old abduction, which is parents confirmed, Circumstantially. We have not looked at anything under hypnosis. Or anything has come out under hypnosis that we didn't already have partial conscious memory. I can't say that's true for everybody, but, but I know Barbara has had people who wanted to look at things and turned out to be nothing. A lot of people would have a problem with what with um Things recalled in dreams, and I know your reason for doing it, because, you know, if something may be a dream, in fact, it, it's a very nebulous area. It's a virtual reality dream, that's like uh -huh. that for sure now. Uh -huh. you know, they still are contact. Do you get any criticism for you it's relying as much on what you call and the your, your, your people you study called dreams? Not that I hear, and it wouldn't change my mind anyway. I, you know, it would these are not things that are hypothetical in my life. They're there. They're real. And I just cannot help it if it's not in somebody else's life and they want to argue with me about it. Right. I mean, my job my job is not to convince anyone of anything. My job is to work with people who already know it's true because they're dealing with it. That's all I see my work as. I'm not out there to change anybody's mind. And I don't blame them for not changing their mind and for having every skeptical question they can have. I think they should. But once it's happening, then you think they'll talk to me and we'll All the women on the on the chart in the back, which I actually found very informative, it's 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 a wonderful way to get thoughts going. Yeah, I found it helped me too. You know. All the women on there list have, have psychic experience of one sort or another listed. And was it did, did they have these? I was going to say before or after the abduction experience. But there is but the no thing such is, thing as before or after if it starts in early childhood. It's before or after knowing you have it. Before consciousness of it. Um, I, I put some of those questions on the questionnaire and, and, and therefore on the chart, they ended up on the chart, because certain people in the field have raised certain points. Oh, we think it's Celtic blood. Oh, we think it's Native American. Oh, we think it's only people who, who the military can get through the intelligence group. Oh, we think it's yeah. child abuse victims. Oh, we think it's psychic. I personally have no reason to doubt that everybody has a psychic gift. Just not developed in some Yeah. I mean, that may just be given. It's like, yes, did they all have blood? Yes, amazingly, every one of the abductees had blood. You know, I, some things are so irrelevant that people want to hold on to as relevant that I just, you know, I don't, I don't see that that may well be. You're going to run into that problem with me, I think, during these questions. Well, that's okay. <laughs> you said something about, you just mentioned the Celtic ancestry. Uh -huh. I noticed all of the women except one had Celtic ancestry listed. And, um... Which is not surprising in the American population if you know our history. Uh-huh. See, the, the, in that, China, they don't. Right. South Africa, they don't. Not that much. But, the, the, but the generally the same, the, what you heard generally, the same things happen in Africa, South Africa, and China. We forget we're not, we forget we're living in a place that has a certain cultural heritage, and it's not global. But Americans tend to be real provincial, and so we got... People we've worked with have killed people. My God, that must be it. Yeah, it must be. Well, they're yeah. not working in the Sahara. You know, yeah. They're not working in Tierra del Fuego. Mm -hmm. You know, they forget. Right. They don't have the people who watch TV or something. Right. Right. So one of the women in your, yeah, I guess you all use pseudonyms. Actually, most of them use their real first names. What I, I consider pseudonym because I didn't identify them by last name. Right. Make it specific. Oh, she described that phoenix vulture type dream with the imagery of God and all that. Um, I'm sorry I didn't, you didn't have the last issue of our magazine because we talked to an ophthalmologist who had a near-death experience. I'm going to give you, I'll give it to you while I'm here. Um, and part of what he talked about was in, uh, in the 50s, there was this doctor in Canada called the Wilder Penfield, I think, and he was operating on epilepsy patients. And the only way to cure them really was to go in and fry the area of their brain electrically that was causing the 
right. the, uh, the, the, yeah, the seizures. Right. But in the midst of that, he went through with a much smaller electrical current, went across areas of their brain, taking, this brings up something with you actually, um, stimulating areas of their brain and asking them what they were seeing, what they were experiencing. And one part of the brain, people would get images of, depending on a lot of the times on their uh, on their um, ancestry, on their back religious background, would see Blessed Virgin Mary, would see saints, would see. Except they were mostly French Canadians and they were Catholics. Yeah. And um, I was that that came to mind when you when you were talking about uh, about Lisa's dream about that. Kind well, of stuff. Lisa knows as I do that most of what she goes through on the frequent basis. Now, there are things that are physical, there's no doubt, like when she almost broke her back, when she was being zapped and bound in the bed. I mean, like the doctor said, my God, if you did parachuting, I've never seen this except in parachuting accidents. Parachuting up out of the bed, yeah. <laughs> but she knows that the virtual reality capabilities, and we don't know how the implant, what role, they may be all the role, they may be none of the role, they may be part of the role in there. We know enough about the, the fact that they have technology that can do this, that she knows they're screwing with her head mentally. She's not really seeing vultures and eagles. She's not really seeing this or that. Half the things they do on, on all, we have to almost automatically assume they're pulling this stuff for whatever programming or... And not just that little area where you see religious symmetry, but your entire brain. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, have, I find no problem with that. I'm not saying how they're doing it. I'm just saying they're doing it. I, I don't, I'm not going to quibble over if they're stimulating this part of the cortex or if they're yeah, doing right. it through an implant or if they're beaming something at you from a machine. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The effect is what I'm dealing with. People mm -hmm. on, the, on the end of this who yeah. are receiving it. And I'm not a technician. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a therapist. Oh, you know, I was talking to you on the phone. Um, oh, you, I, this is a question that you just, you just answered in there about the, the woman in the in the bed with the VRS while she threw the blue. Right. Um, which led to another question. How can whoever is doing this to people, be they agents of the government or alien service or something, how do they keep from getting people walking in on them or seeing them from a distance? They or? don't always. They Such don't as? know it. Well, Tyson Ted Marie Francis. Uh-huh. Um, Linda Cortiel, if it's a real case, I don't know. I haven't investigated it. Right. Um, several people I uh, have worked with, some I've reported on in the book, and you may just say, it's just so trivial, you might not pay attention. Others that I, a lot more I haven't reported on. Neighbors have seen craft over the house the night the person has something happen, and they didn't see the craft, but the neighbors did, or... Uh, you know, that sort of thing. We get inadvertent witnesses to some evidence that, that seems linked to this. Occasionally, maybe the Cortiel thing, maybe the thing with Ted Francis and the Marines, was a very close-up witness in uh, inadvertent events. For all I know, maybe they do it on purpose. We still don't know the agenda. We don't know the program. You know, it's funny when you said about the ceiling opening up. I, I talked to a friend of mine in Los Angeles, and she has a friend that... Uh, he said ever since he was a little kid, every once in a while the ceiling in his room would open up, would have been, um, things would come down out of the ceiling and talk to him. And, I, yeah. and she said he doesn't want to talk to anybody about it, but I thought you might be interested. So, I mean, that doesn't leave me where I can't talk to the guy. Well, if you're, if you're you know, interested in talking with a lot of abduction research people, you'll find over and over and over again the walls dissolved and they came through, the ceiling disappeared and they came through. If nobody's watching, we don't know if the ceiling fits carrying they're going through, if they're having one of these little scenarios going on. We just don't know. We, you know, and, and you can try. People have tried monitoring themselves with cameras. They've tried, you know, sitting up all night to watch somebody else. It's, we're going to have to do better than that, or we're not going to catch them. And I'm not, I can't tell you what to do that's better than that. Uh, there's people out there a lot smarter than I am who should be working on that. Mm -hmm. I think they're physical and finite and fallible, given what I've seen from first-hand experience. In what way? Besides another, oh, well, one example is what we just talked about. Yeah, flipping up on this, flipping up on that. There is hope. Well, I think there is hope. I think that the, one of the biggest 
deceptions they perpetrate on us is that we can't do anything about it. If we couldn't do anything about it, it wouldn't be paralyzing and, and just repressing. We wouldn't be talking right now. Right. We wouldn't be hiding it. Right. And you read the last theory, last page or two of Taken. You know I do have an optimistic potential theory. Mm -hmm. I have something. <laughs> no. Or you wouldn't be here. That's right. I just don't feel as hopeless I feel. In fact, I've felt for the last year or so a growing sense of certainty and joy and something inside that we're getting there. We're going to get there. We're not boring in vain. Uh -huh. But then people say, oh, you're just getting a religion. Well, you know, people know me. I'm not that way. Yeah. You know, it's just a feeling that's grown stronger as I go from top to bottom. Right. Right. It's based on experience. It's based, and also having learned one thing that this has taught me is to pay more attention to my gut. I've been, I'm not a, I don't know right brain and left brain what those things mean. I know one means one thing, one means the other, but it's not my bag. But I've been more given to scrutiny of an intellectual sort than an intuitive, oh my gut, says do it. Well, I'm learning to listen a whole lot more in the last few years to that instinctive thing, and it is, that's a growth that I think has been part of my necessity to learn how to cope and survive better with this. Man, it, you know, I, I think I've worked it up. Right. Thanks. How about you? I'm still on it. Thank you. So, I, you know, maybe that's part of what we're going to have to get even stronger at doing is, is combining them. I called it tricameralism just in a, you know, very symbolic sense. I'm not talking li literally growing a new lobe. Yeah. <laughs> Although, I don't rule anything out. Right. But, you know what I'm talking about, perceptively, mm -hmm. and part of that may be learning to get that up more to a conscious surface so we can really manipulate it. Most people who, are, who have psychic gifts or, or have psychic flashes or stuff can't control it. Yeah. It comes. We're going to have to get to a point of controlling yeah. some of our, our better Well, that's the goal of mystical practices and, and specifically and Western occultism for the last... You know, maybe thousand years. But it may be it's not. And before then, in a different form. You know, it may well be that it's going to take the kind of intense stress we're seeing under this thing before it really kicks in. Desire may not be enough. Practice certainly has not been for a lot of people. You said they do it. Yeah, mother. You said they were coming in to control people and put them back in line, but it seems like it's helping people to evolve beyond trying to... Remember that double-edged sword I talked about that kicked us into enough intelligence to take care of the farm and didn't mean it to go any further and mm -hmm. still was going. You know, I, I see this as a highly ironic possibility. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know. I think it could go even beyond that. It could be like a double blind where it's just kind of the, uh, the uh, tough mothering or tough father thing where they're forcing us to evolve. No, I don't. I, I, I think that's really, really stretching it. Uh, I think it, it's a desperate desire on the part of those really good hearts who don't want there to be devils, right. you know? And I'm not saying they're devils. Like I said, I think they're physical and finite and fallible. But, you know, there are some people who are so evil in their actions, they feel like devils, but they're still born of a mother and a father. So I'm just using that metaphorically. So they can't, you know, I believe in devils or something. But no, I, I think we, in fact, that's the only probably uh, real, well, I have another, but real criticism I have of ballet thinking is that he will go from here to Waco to San Antonio to Brownsville to here to avoid the straight line that logic and evidence most points to because he doesn't like what's on the other end of that line. And he will go to absurd illogical lengths of reasoning to avoid something that he finds Personally, not John Keel does that too. Oh, John Keel makes that stuff. I've checked out when he gets there. But yet he criticized in one of his articles a uh, little fanzines, I guess, all like the thing that don't check their references and uh, things like well, that. Well, I spent, I spent a lot of money and time checking out one story. Now, some of the stuff I've checked out obscurely is there, and I'm glad that, you know, I, I used to check a lot of stuff that I was interested in, and I finally think, yeah, they're really there. But one story that he just totally, I mean, it was so easily obvious to check it. In Bruce Burke in an Asbury Park, New Jersey, I happen to be a Springsteen person. I go to Asbury Park. I used to go a lot. This story said, talked about this guy named Bruce Burke, who was abducted right off of the, the, the shore there, probably not two blocks from the Stone Pony. 
have missing for two months. They put out flyers, had mentioned searches. They finally held a memorial service for the guy. Damn, he's back for two months later. Doesn't know where he's been. Described the guy physically. Gave the date. It did not happen. Okay? I checked everything from the police to the papers to the morgue to the everything. Yeah. Funeral home. Not even somebody with a different name. It didn't work. Right, so that sort of bothered me. You know, I like Kill's work. I enjoy reading it. But as, as far as what you want to base yeah. your life on, I'd be careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like his ideas. Yeah. Right. And I, the one thing I love about him is that um, nobody did say God had to be saved. You know, I think that's important to remember. You know, well, one thing Belay said, which I always thought was very fun, was just because a message comes from God doesn't mean it isn't stupid. <laughs> yeah. talking about dreams a little bit, bit ago, and you say a lot of the uh, people you've dealt with, including you, have that night of lights, numerous UFOs coming from oh, yeah. dreams. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what made that special, because I've had that dream more than a few times. A friend of mine, Peter, actually, I think he has, he's got suspicions. Not a suspicion, he's pretty sure of it. He's had exactly. experiences like abduction experiences. Well, I think My it's friend it's Robert, he has the same. Have you had it? No, no, I In different okay. scenarios, I've had yeah. the same dream a couple of times. I've had it probably twice, I guess, over the 88. In different scenarios, right? But, but essentially... What involved?